There's a question that the Buddha recommends that the monks ask themselves every day. And it's a good question for anybody who practices to ask him or herself. What am I becoming as days and nights fly past, fly past? And as a John Fung once said, suppose the Buddha were standing in front of you right now asking you that question, how would you answer? Would you be able to say, I'm becoming concentrated, I'm seeing things more clearly? Or if things aren't going well in the mind, I'm fighting them. At the very least, you want to be able to say, yeah, I'm fighting things that are not going well. Don't be the sort of person who allows the defilements just to step over your head and you give up entirely. Your mind can't settle down trying to figure out why. And have that kind of fighting spirit. It may seem strange that the Buddha would have you ask yourself, what kind of person am I becoming? After all, we hear that this is all about not becoming anything or becoming nobody. But that's not the case. The Buddha taught that we can use our sense of self as what he calls a governing principle, in other words, something that keeps us on the path. An important part of our self, of course, is the narratives we tell, or we, that we can tell about how we've behaved. So what kind of narrative do you have as a meditator? What kind of narrative do you have in your life? We all start out with difficulties. We all start out with setbacks. Some of us have a more difficult time than others. But we have the choice. Are we going to be the kind of people who let the difficulties overcome us? Or are we going to be kind of the kind of people who overcome them? That's a story that we create through our actions. In the Buddhist text, you've got the stories of the Buddha's awakening, the things he did that led up to his awakening, the various problems he encountered, and how he got past them. And the same for the, the monks and the nuns. They tell their stories. And again, people have said that it sounds peculiar in a religion that has a teaching on not-self, teachings on emptiness. Why all this concern with autobiography? It's because the basic teaching is not not-self and it's not emptiness. The basic teaching is karma. And these are stories that show the power of karma, that circumstances can be bad, but you look at what you're doing to make the circumstances bad, so you can change it. The Buddha gives examples. This is how it's done. And it's a good story. I know a monk who has lots of adventures in the forest in Thailand, and sometimes I wonder if he's having the adventures so he have good stories to tell afterwards. Well, it's not a bad motivation, because it gives you a strong sense of how you are in charge. You're the one who gets to write the story through your actions. Of course, you want to be able to tell a true story, so you really have to do things that you can talk about. And whether or not you talk about them to other people, you can talk about them to yourself, and you can gain a sense of encouragement. I used to have these difficulties, but now I've got to pass them. Now I used to have those problems, and now I've got to pass them. And that's an important part of having a strong sense of the power of your actions that they really do make a difference. We live in a world, as the Buddha said, it's an uneven world. It's a world that's out of tune. The Pali word here, Sama, is a really interesting term. It's applied to roads that are even. We Sama is uneven. It's also applied to instruments. If an instrument is Sama, it's in tune. If it's a We Sama, it's out of tune. And here being in tune and out of tune when the Buddha applies it to actions. This relates to an image that you see in a lot of ancient cultures, that a musical instrument in tune is a good analogy for the kind of person you want to be, the kind of actions you want to have. They're in tune with the principles of nature, in tune with the principles of what's skillful and what's not.
And so we often find ourselves as trying to act in an in-tune way in an out-of-tune world. It's not just today that this is the situation. That was the situation back in the Buddhist times. So you think about the precepts, you think about his teachings on concentration and discernment. You want to be in tune with those. You want to be in tune also with the, the stories you hear of the monks and the nuns and other people who have been successful in the practice. They give you an idea. This is how it's done. This is the kind of life you live. This is the kind of person you become. And one of the qualities that's true across the board is that they become really solid people. They have a very strong sense of what's right what's wrong, what's skillful what's not skillful. They have a sense of shame around behaving in an unskillful way, which is the obverse side of having a sense of honor and self-esteem that comes when you have behaved in a good way. So this is a teaching that measures us by our actions. It doesn't measure us by our background or how we look or any things that the world tends to measure us by. I mean, you look at the four estagons. They all came from a very poor part of Thailand. Many of them came from very poor families. And if you looked at them from the outside, you say, these people don't have a chance. But they made themselves, they made the chance through their actions. They made themselves into something really special. Not that they went around talking about how special they were, but I'm sure a good part of the practice was having that sense I'd be ashamed to tell other people that I just sat there and did nothing when I was meditating. I let the defilements run all over me. At the very least, as the John Mahabhu says, you want to have a fighting spirit. And even if it means losing in the beginning, it's better than not fighting at all. So we're practicing here to help ourselves have the strength that's needed in order to act in an honorable way act in a way that's in tune with the, the Buddhist teachings. We're trying to still the mind so we can see our actions. The fact that this is a central issue, you see it all over. When people would talk about what the Buddha was a teacher of, the monks would say, well, he's a teacher of karma. He was a gamawadi, someone who teaches karma. When monks from other sects were coming to ask to ordain, the first question was, are you a Gamawadi too, or you don't believe in the power of action? If you didn't believe in the power of action, you would be put on probation. And that included monks who thought that there was no self. So it's the action that's important, the, your understanding of action, and your ability to use that understanding to do something skillful. So the question is not what you are. Sometimes you hear that the teaching is, well, once you understand who you are, that you are interconnected with all beings and there's no real you there or whatever, then you will act in a skillful way naturally. The Buddha never said that. He said you have to understand action first by following the precepts and watching yourself as you follow the precepts, because they're good guidelines for when you can begin to see that you're going off the path. It's very clear. These are do's and don'ts that you take on. Not because you're just obeying somebody, it's because you learn about yourself by taking them on. And again, you see the power of action. Similarly, when you do concentration, you're going to stay with the breath. Then you're not going to let your mind wander around all over the place where it likes, just noting this and noting that and not really having a good place to settle down. It's having that place to settle down that allows you to see how oh, the mind's moved. And you bring it back. And then once again, you bring it back. Sometimes in the beginning it's discouraging because it seems to be moving off every place but the breath. But if you're persistent, give yourself pep talks. Remind yourself of times when you have dealt with difficulties in the past and you were able to overcome them. Well, here's another example of how you can do that. And you'll have a good story to tell. You're not telling other people, you can tell yourself, okay, that was the night that things finally settled down. It's not going to happen just by allowing things to wander around all over the place. It'll happen when you really work on it. 
because in getting the mind to settle down like this, then you have a good default mode. In other words, this is the way things should be, and when they go off the default, you notice that something's wrong. Something needs to be looked into. This is why concentration is such a good foundation for discernment. Because how are you going to know your defilements unless you see them move? Now you can see them move if you're not still. So all of these teachings point to the importance of action. And when it gets to the point of looking at yourself and taking on the teachings of self and not self, that too is a teaching on action. In other words, you see your sense of self as something you do, as something you put together. Then you ask yourself, which things do I want to identify with and which things not? You've got a choice. It's not like you're stuck with some sort of conventional self. You want to get rid of it. You've got a self that you've been creating. You've got many selves, actually, that you've been creating. Then you want to ask yourself, are these skillful or not? You're able to step back, see them as actions. And the self, the sense of self that encourages you on the path, that's the self as a governing principle. That's when you want to keep in your stable for a long time. As for the others, you can set them out to pasture. Those are the ones that you brand as not-self. Again, you have the choice to identify or not identify. These are actions. Then as your mind gets more still, you begin to see these actions in more and more subtle forms. So, of course, ultimately we're working to a point where, as John Munn says, you know, nirvana has no action. Each of the Four Noble Truths has a duty, but nirvana doesn't have a duty. There's no action there at all. But you get there through acting skillfully and looking very carefully at your actions. And to act, you need strength. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, but it's also one of the reasons why we try to live a really moral life, why we try to live evenly in an uneven world or in tune in a world that's out of tune, because that gives us strength, and it gives strength to our actions. So what you're becoming right now is an important question. Are you becoming concentrated? Okay, good. Are you becoming clearer? That's good. If you're not, are you working at becoming concentrating clear. That's good, too. So if the Buddha asked you, if the Buddha were to come and ask you, you'd be able to give him an answer that you'd be proud to give. That kind of pride is not a defilement.